Video games like to make you jump through more hoops than a dachshund at a dog show in order to get your grubby mitts on some ridiculously cool and unique items. Sometimes, however, we jump through loads of hoops to get something mundane which you ought to be able to find lying around everywhere. Like an empty bottle? My recycling bin is full of these! Here then are the weirdly rare items we work surprisingly hard for. Beware spoilers for the following. The economics of Hyrule are a real puzzle, like how is a castle of this size maintained with the taxes of only about seven local businesses? And one of those is the Happy Masks shop, and seriously, who is shopping in here? Ugh. One thing we know for sure though is that a major part of Hyrule's business ecosystem is milk, produced in volumes large enough to sustain entire ranches, like this one in Ocarina of Time. Which makes it all the more bizarre that one of the hardest items to obtain in any Zelda game, including this one, is an empty bottle. With Lon Lon Ranch shipping out enough crates of milk every day to keep an entire kingdom hydrated and strong of bone, you'd think empty bottles would be littering the streets, yet incredibly there are only four of these glass receptacles to be found in the entire world. And none of these bottles are easily obtained either, with most serving as rewards in huge air quotes for punishing side quests, like searching an entire village for cuckoos and bringing them back to their owner, who can't do it herself because she has allergies? Uh, thanks, I guess, and not to tell you how to live your life, madam, but if you're allergic, can I suggest getting out of the cuckoo business? I'd suggest getting into the bottle trade, I think you'd make a killing. At its most ridiculous, the quest for empty bottles sees Link trawling the vastness of Hyrule Field, looking for ten deadly ghosts to fight. Why? Because rid Hyrule of its murder ghost problem, and your reward for performing this invaluable and terrifying service is… you guessed it… Trouble is, empty bottles are extremely desirable, and indeed necessary to complete the game, thanks to their ability to store life-preserving fairies, health items, bugs, fish, and all sorts. So you'll go to any lengths necessary to get one, all the while wondering why one of the rarest items in this magical fantasy land is an object so commonplace in real life, I can get you one right now by just emptying this tequila bottle. Okay, fine, I'll finish the video first, but then it's party time? And besides, Link, you're literally saving the world. Can't you just get Princess Zelda to give you some spare bottles? And while she's at it, get her to shut down the Happy Mask Shop. I'm convinced this place is a pyramid scheme. Come in. Welcome to Goreheart, the last settlement before the Feylands. How can I fill your pack today? When you're heading out on an adventure, you want to be able to carry as much as possible, like, oh, say, 500 potions. You don't know I won't need them. In highly underrated action RPG Kingdoms of Amala Reckoning, they helpfully let you upgrade your carry capacity with backpacks, something that in real life you've got at least 12 of in the back of a cupboard somewhere. But unlike New York City, which is apparently filled with Peter Parker's infinite supply of backpacks, the Feylands seem to be extremely short on them. In fact, there are only six backpacks in the entire realm, meaning that there are fewer of these than wonders of the ancient world. In order to get your hands on a backpack that will add a mere ten slots to your inventory, you must find one of the very few merchants that sell them. And each of these merchants will only sell you one backpack, because apparently these things are rarer than a steak that's never seen a frying pan. I'm pleased to be of service. Oh, come on, dude, you're wearing one! As if tracking down these scarce satchels wasn't painful enough, they're also some of the priciest things in the game. The first one you find in Gorehart Village, after literally stumbling out of a pile of corpses in nothing but rags, costs over 7,000 gold. Sorry, mate, I'm a little short. Goodbye. And so begins your epic adventure to eventually afford something that school children carry their books in every day. And this one doesn't even have Dora the Explorer on it.
I've never had to acquire rope, but I assume not everyone who has acquired rope had to get it the way it's obtained in Leisure Suit Larry, or at least I really hope not. Because the steps involved to get this most mundane of objects are ludicrous in the extreme, but without rope you've got no chance of completing this skeezy 1987 text adventure, which begins with Larry chasing a blow-up sex doll across the screen and, hey, that more or less sets the tone. Larry needs a bottle of pills resting on a windowsill, but to get them, by law of text adventure logic, he needs to dangle from a fire escape using rope. Unfortunately, in Leisure Suit Larry, rope is so rare and precious, we presume it's made of Hithlane, like the rope gifted Samwise by Galadriel, the Lady of Light in the Fellowship of the Ring. I emailed the developers for confirmation, and their silence speaks volumes. Rope is acquired from Fawn, a woman you meet in a casino, but you can't just ask Fawn nicely. Instead, you must shower her with a series of gifts collected from other locations. These gifts are candy, a rose, and a diamond ring, which doesn't make Fawn give you any rope, but does make her open to the idea of dancing with you. Larry, I dare say if you can throw a person that high, you've probably got the upper arm strength to reach that windowsill, I'm just saying. At this point you get the rope. <laughs> just kidding. At this point you get married. Larry, what the hell man? All you need is rope! Did you seriously misunderstand the phrase tie the knot? Now lawfully wedded to Fawn, you're invited by your new wife up to her hotel suite to, shall we say, celebrate your new love. But not until you turn on the radio to set the mood and take a cab across town to the liquor store because Fawn needs wine. Maybe now would be an opportunity to drive to a hardware store, Larry. They sell rope, I'm pretty sure. No, instead it's a cab back across town to the suite where your wife Fawn is ready to take your relationship to the next level. Or so it seems until she, well, ties you to the bed. Your marriage may be over, but at least you got the rope once you cut yourself free using a pocket knife. I forget why we needed it in the first place now. Something to do with Galadriel? We've got her! wouldn't think you'd need lockpicks in Resident Evil games on account of how every locked door you encounter is held shut by some kind of elaborate chess puzzle or ornate crest nonsense. But Resident Evil does still include enough lockpicking for Jill to have earned this nickname. Here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. Whereas Jill is just handed a lockpick in the first Resident Evil game, she has a harder time getting her hands on one in Resident Evil 3, where she needs it to open simple locks, i.e. ones that don't require a key or putting rare jewels into things. Oh, and if the words simple lock gave you the impression that this process was going to be easy, well have I got some disappointing news for you. Instead of finding this tool just lying around, Jill Valentine has to get herself into the star's office of the Raccoon City Police Department in order to retrieve her trusty lockpick from her desk. This requires fighting her way through zombie-infested corridors, praying the whole time that the biomutant nemesis doesn't show up and have her guts for garters. Not only that, but she needs the special emblem key to get into the star's office, which is in storage behind a number code secured locker because apparently a bunch of zombies trying to kill you isn't enough of a hassle. But still, I'm sure this lockpick is worth the hassle, given the calibre of gear that members of stars are usually issued and uh oh. It's just a safety pin and a bit of wire. Sure, where else could she find such specialised equipment? Yes, Jill has to slog her way back to her desk to fetch two bits of metal that if you looked hard enough, you'd probably find you have five of in your pocket right now. Seriously, Jill is the master of unlocking. If she's that good, couldn't she just make another lockpick? We hear hairpins are pretty good. Fortunately for Jill, the Resident Evil 3 remake gives her lockpick a much deserved upgrade by, well, making it an actual set of professional lockpicking tools with a torsion wrench and everything. Not that it's going to help us much with this guy, who also received an upgrade or two. Thanks, game! Post-game. 
Pokemon trainers are no strangers to the concept of rarity. Just ask all the Lillipups in Pokemon Go who got mulched into candy for having the temerity to be neither rare nor interesting. But in the world of Pokemon Gold and Silver for the Game Boy Color, it's not just Pokemon that are rare. In fact, there's one item that's seemingly rarer than a shiny Mew with a seasonal hat. That item is one you need to get past a weird tree that is stopping you from traveling along Route 37, and thereby standing between you and your Pokemon destiny. By this point in the game, players will already be accustomed to using the exciting move Cut to scythe through trees blocking their path. But Cut doesn't, uh, cut it here. You're given a cryptic hint by a nearby NPC about sprinkling water, so perhaps the surf move? Help me out here, game. Turns out what you need is a super special item, and spoiler alert, the item you need is a water bottle, by which we mean a bottle that squirts water, of which there is seemingly only one to be found in the entire Johto region, and you can't acquire it without first going through a whole series of Pokemon battles, culminating in a fight with Gym Leader Whitney. It's a tough battle, but not as tough as Whitney crying when you win. Come on, Whitney, what's this really about? Is it about you being an expert in normal-type Pokémon? The lamest flavour of Pokémon? Regardless, defeat Whitney and the local florist is impressed enough to deem you capable of wielding a water bottle, which is damning with faint praise if ever we heard it. Which means now you can squirt the tree, which, surprise, turns out to be the Pokémon Pseudo Wudo in disguise, and its pet peeve is moisture, I guess. Even weirder is that all the mythical squirt bottle does in the end is spray water on the pseudo wudo, which you'd think could be accomplished any number of easier ways. Spitting on it, waiting for it to rain, bringing a well hydrated Arcanine on a long walk and letting nature take its course. Regardless, by the time you're through, it's hard not to feel that this was a lot of effort for an item you probably never needed in the first place. Note, however, this criticism does not apply to later versions of the game and the anime, where the squirt bottle is shaped like a little squirtle, and we absolutely do need that and would do anything to acquire it, up to and including murder. Minecraft is a game that lets you make anything your mind can dream up, as long as it's made out of blocks. One cool thing you can craft in Minecraft is cake, and obviously we want cake, because cake is great! Minecraft's version of our favourite tea time treat is a good food source in the game, giving you multiple portions to chomp through. Plus, making it awards you with a nifty achievement called the lie. Aha, we see what you did there, Minecraft. P portal P Portal reference. In the real world, getting hold of a piece of cake is, well, a piece of cake, as you can easily buy it or rustle one up in your kitchen. However, there are so many steps to the Minecraft counterpart, it would make a pedometer blush. See, to make anything in Minecraft, you need to make all the tools and components for it, but none of them takes the biscuit quite like making a cake. Fun fact, biscuits are different to cake because when biscuits go stale, they go soft, and when cake goes stale, it goes hard. Okay, okay, I'll get on with it, alright. First off, you need wheat, which you get by punching grass to get seeds, punching some trees to get wood, making a crafting table so you can craft a wooden hoe, using that hoe to till soil next to some water, planting the seeds and then letting them grow for a few in-game days until you can harvest them. Then there's sugar, which involves you hunting around the world for sugarcane, which involves fewer steps than wheat, but may involve a hike across half the map depending on where you spawned. You also need an egg, which means you need a chicken. If you're lucky, you might find a chicken that has laid an egg right next to them in the wild. If you're not lucky, however, you need to punch more grass to get more seeds, lure the first chicken you find back to a pen, and wait impatiently for them to lay some more eggs. And finally, there's the milk, which is the real kicker. First off, you have to find one or more cows, and ideally trap them, we mean bring them back to your lovely farm. But this is the easy part. See, the recipe calls for three buckets of milk, and to get those you first have to punch a tree to get wood, make a wooden pickaxe on your crafting table, mine some stone with that wooden pickaxe, make a stone pickaxe, hunt down and mine coal and nine blocks of iron ore with that stone pickaxe, mine some more stone, make a furnace with that stone, smelt your iron ore with the coal, then use the iron ingots to make three buckets. Then, and only then, you can go milk your cow. Put it all together, and finally you have your delicious cake. 
Wow, that was definitely worth all the effort. It's not even red velvet. There's no funfetti. Animal Crossing New Horizons is a game about moving to an island and imprisoning all the local wildlife in a museum run by an owl. Honestly, game narratives are getting so predictable these days. Seriously though, it's a genuine delight to gather new specimens for the island museum, and see this sprawling building gradually fill up with creatures. So much so, you'll barely have time to think about whether this fish's tank is big enough. Probably not, but I guess we'll never know for sure. After all, it's not one of the species of animal in the game that's evolved to talk. Just as well, it'd probably kill my town rating by complaining there aren't enough flowers or something. Now, for the most part, New Horizons has a good grasp of which creatures are more exciting and therefore hard to catch than others. It's a big deal, for instance, when you reel in this monster. Yes! Woo! We did it! And not a big deal when you catch your millionth sea bass and you've seen the comedy flavour text so often it becomes a cruel joke. <laughs> Classic. How do they keep the material so fresh? But there is one creature in the game that's much rarer than you'd expect, bearing in mind how alarmingly common it is in real life, and that's a fly. It's reckoned that for every human on the planet there are 17 million flies, a statistic that rings true for anyone who's ever spent time on Earth and will agree that there are absolutely bloody loads of flies on it. And yet, this most horribly ordinary of bugs is weirdly hard to bag in New Horizons. To get a fly in your museum you'll first need to go fishing. Why? Because when you fish there is a small chance that you'll accidentally fish up some trash like an old can, boot or tyre. Odds are that if this has happened to you, you'll have sold that garbage or used it as a crafting material to make something nice, but you'll wish you didn't as leaving trash lying around outside is the best way to attract flies. You can also wait a whole IRL week for a turnip to go rotten if you're in no rush, though expect every other island resident to silently judge you as a terrible investor in the in-game turnip stock exchange. With all these steps followed, a fly may spawn, but there are still no guarantees and you might have to wait many days before you see one, and dare we say that lurking anxiously around a pile of garbage clutching a net was not what you expected from life on a tropical island. The fly's relative scarcity is made all the weirder by how frequently you'll see much more exotic creatures flitting around like it's nothing. Honestly, in real life I've never seen or heard of a Raja Brooks birdwing, but three flies have bothered me just in the time it took to say this. Alright, alright, I'll do my laundry. Jeez, flies. So judgmental. Tell me how to live. Still, when you do eventually nab your fly to be donated, you can take pride in paying a visit to see it on show. Gather round islanders and witness the majesty of nature in all its fury. Okay, there's an actual T-Rex skeleton in the next room. Why am I staring at flies again? So there are some of the weirdly rare items you work surprisingly hard for considering that in real life and in many other games they're actually quite easy to get hold of. Why do we have to go through all that? What? Uh, can you think of any other examples? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, uh, maybe give it a thumbs up. That might be quite cool. Um, maybe check out some of our other videos as well, uh, both here on Outside Extra and on Outside Xbox. We do weekly shows. Uh, they are show of the weekend and show of the week. Maybe you can check them out. Uh, if you subscribe, you will see them all the time, especially if you hit that bell. And uh, thanks for watching. We will hopefully see you next time. Bye.